You're watching Channel 12 Eyewitness News, Southern New England's news station. He was shot in the line of duty. Today, a Rhode Island state trooper testifies against the man accused of pulling the trigger. Is the water coming from your faucet safe to drink? We'll tell you what you can do to keep it contamination free. And an Alzheimer's alert. Take a test doctors say can help fend off the debilitating disease. Channel 12 Eyewitness News begins right now. Good evening, I'm Walter Cryer. And I'm Karen Adams. He's accused of shooting a Rhode Island state trooper today. A jury heard Edward Humphrey's confession for the first time. Humphrey's the man you see here in court. Police say under questioning, he admitted the shooting trooper John Lamont last October. Listen to what Humphrey says about that traffic stop along Route 95. <laughs> Humphrey's confession wasn't the only compelling testimony heard in court. The survivor of that roadside That's shooting right gave his side of the story. Channel 12's Doug Lazette has more. State Trooper John Lamont took the witness stand and pointed to the man accused of trying to kill him. Sitting right there. Lamont says Edward Humphrey shot him. Any question in your mind? No question in my mind whatsoever. Lamont recalled the events of October 15, 1994, when he stopped the pickup truck on Route 95 in Richmond. The trooper says as he approached the driver, the man greeted him with a gun. The subject leaned out the window, pointed a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol and fired one shot. It would have vented right about here. And can you tell us where the bullet exited? Exited just, just left of the middle of my back. Although the bullet wound nearly killed Lamont, he managed to shoot back at the suspect and return to his patrol car radio to report what just happened. That shots had been fired, that I was hit, that the vehicle was an orange truck and it was headed southbound on 95. Minutes later, when police spotted the truck and Humphrey, they say he shot at them again. But this time, he missed. In South Kingstown, Douglas at Channel 12, Eyewitness News. After closing arguments tomorrow, case goes to the jury. In more law and order tonight, the fate of a former ACI prison guard lies in the hands of a jury. Bernard Speaks is accused of pointing a gun at his baby son during a police standoff last year. Police say he became outraged after losing custody. Providence police are looking for clues after a man is found murdered on the city's south side. 39-year-old Kenneth Thomas found shot in the head and neck last night. Police say Thomas had an extensive criminal record. No arrests have been made. And this man, 32-year-old Ramon Liano, featured last night on Channel 12 Southern New England's Most Wanted. Thanks to a viewer, two hours later, Providence police got a tip and Liano was captured. He was arrested in Seekonk on cocaine and other charges. Tempers flare in the O.J. Simpson double murder trial today. Prosecutor Marsha Clark and Judge Lance Ito have it out. Channel 12's Karen Southern has been following today's proceedings and joins us live from Edit 12 with the latest. Karen? Walter, criminalist Dennis Fung is being cross-examined right now. Now, he is the man who collected evidence, blood evidence, after the double murders. Now, earlier today, it seems prosecution was misbehaving. They didn't tell defense attorneys about a police videotape they had of O.J. Simpson's home. So Judge Lance Edel slapped them on the hand and ordered them to hand over every single videotape they have. Also today, the jury saw pictures of blood stains all over Simpson's Bronco. And the police expert spent a lot of time describing how carefully he handled evidence, even showing jurors inside pictures of a police lab where the evidence was processed. Prosecution describing everything in detail, trying to prove that they, they did not botch the investigation because that is what defense attorneys claim. Back to you, Walt. Okay, Karen, stay with us for continuing coverage tonight on 12 on 12. Where have voters deciding tonight whether they want to take a chance on gambling? They're heading to the polls to voice their opinions on a proposed casino in nearby New Bedford. We should know the results of the non-binding referendum later tonight. Last month, the people of Westport said no to the casino. But just last night, voters in Dartmouth said yes. Now people living in Wareham, Rochester, and Marion must decide what they think. It's a non-binding referendum. 
so the casino will likely be built regardless of those elections. Casino backers banking that casino gambling will bring more tourists to the area, and that could translate into a big payday economically. Project Payday is our commitment to putting Southern New Englanders back to work, and more work may be in the future for a lot of local folks, because of Channel 12, Sean Hennessy found out tourism is up. In Newport, there is a calm before the storm on the water and on the streets that are just about empty in this off-season. But it's only a matter of time before the invasion of tourists begins. Good news for some. It's pretty much everything I depend on during the summer because I have to, of course, pay for college and I need spending money. Sean Rice works on a ferry every summer to help pay for tuition at Salve Regina University. I don't think, I don't think I'd be going here if it wasn't for tourism. Besides jobs, tourism creates lots of money, and no one knows that better than t-shirt and sweatshirt shops like this, which can make as much as $3,000 in a single day. According to the Rhode Island Department of Economic Development, tourism brings in about 29 million visitors a year and about $1.4 billion in revenue. It's our fastest growing industry, and there are some predictions that it will be the biggest industry in Rhode Island within two decades. I'd say most of my, most of my friends, most people I know depend on it. For Sean Rice and others, it's an industry that's helping get an education. Sean Hennessy, Channel 12 Eyewitness News. More news on the Project Payday front tonight. The proposed mall that may be built in Providence could be close to becoming a reality. Now here's where developers want to break ground at the site used for URI classes. Governor Lincoln Allman has been against the mall because federal money needed for roads will be used to build a parking garage. But tonight, Allman is close to cutting a deal with developers. The news not so good tonight for a medical waste treatment company in one socket. Tonight's Stericycle faces a $3.3 million fine. The Department of Environmental Management says the company knowingly violated permit conditions to save money. The EM alleges some employees were exposed to life-threatening diseases because the waste, including syringes, was not treated properly. The EM says a few concerned former employees tipped them off. Well, if you're drinking tap water right now, you probably think it's perfectly safe. But do you really know? 12 on your side conducted its own water test by collecting water samples from two homes, one in Massachusetts and one in Rhode Island. The local lab came back with the startling results. The water from Rhode Island was fine, but the home in Massachusetts came back positive for coliform bacteria. That's a lot of questions. So yesterday, the water department and 12 on your side retested the water from that home again. And Susan Hogan joins us now with the results. And Susan, what were they? Well, they were all negative, which is certainly good news. Now, this could mean a couple of things. Number one, the person who was taking the test had some bacteria on his hands, or there could be a buildup of bacteria somewhere around his faucet, so he should retest his water in about a month just to make sure it's okay. Now, what should you do as a homeowner or even as a renter to make sure you're doing everything possible to keep your water safe? Here are some ideas. Let's start at the kitchen sink, since most of the water we use to cook or drink with comes from here. What you can do is unscrew the faucet aerator. And see this little screen right there? Well, a lot of times bacteria can get in there and build up and clog. So if it does, or if you haven't replaced it in about a year or so, go out and buy yourself a new one. It will only cost you about $2, and it will give you peace of mind. Another thing we need to be careful with is when we handle raw meat, whether it be hamburger or chicken, we're always told to make sure that we use hot soapy water on our cutting boards. But what about our faucet? Remember, you just handled raw meat, and if you go and move your faucet or touch anywhere around this area, you have live bacteria on your hands that can get up here and grow and eventually land in our drinking water. So just like you do with your cutting boards, use hot soapy water to clean the faucet. And let's just say you woke up in the morning, head to the bathroom to get your first glass of water of the day. But stop. Before you do it, let the water run for a good couple of minutes. Don't forget your pipes have been sitting overnight for about eight hours. Just let the water flush through the whole system before you get your glass. And when it comes to your water pipes, there's really no way that you can physically check to see if they're okay. The best indicator is if your water starts to change color, especially a rust color. That either means the pipes are getting really old or something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you have water filters like this one, it's imperative you change the filters. If you don't, the filters become incubators for bacteria, 
and eventually you'll have bacteria living inside the old filter and eventually into your drinking water. So really read the directions. I mean, they're there for a reason, so you've got to follow them. All right. Thanks, Susan. If you want your water tested, you can call your local water department or contact a certified lab. You're looking live now at the Eyewitness News Data Center. Experts are standing by to answer your questions about the memory debilitating disease, Alzheimer's. And how is your memory? Take the memory test. Look at these 12 simple images for a few seconds and commit as many as you can to memory. During the break, write down the ones you remember. We'll take another look at this picture in a few minutes to see how you did. Channel 12's Jack Burns is walking the beat with cops in your community. This four-legged member of the state police force has a unique specialty. Hannibal has assisted in the recovery of eight bodies. Meet this amazing canine and pick up the scent on his crime-fighting talent. Go on Crime Patrol, tonight at 11 on 12 on 12. <laughs> This is Channel 12 Eyewitness News with Walter Grimes and Karen Adams. Tonight, an Alzheimer's alert. The very latest on the disease that can wipe out your memory. Could you recall all 12 of the objects we showed you just before the break? Well, we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, let's send it to Karen Adams in the data center with a number you need to know. Karen? Okay, Walter, right now our phone lines are open. And of course, we have volunteers here to answer all your questions about Alzheimer's. Now, before you dial those or call those numbers on your screen, Channel 12's Pat Master shows us how you scored on your memory test and why it is important. In Paris, just a short jog from the Eiffel Tower, Dr. Monique Laponsin is activating brains. Les yeux. Donc, les yeux. She's been studying the human brain for 17 years and has examined thousands of case studies. They show mental exercise is just as important as physical exercise. People generally, they don't look after their brains, they look after their other organs. If you don't, you lose mental fitness and memory. Scientists now know Alzheimer's can strike earlier in life if you don't stay mentally active. Dr. Jean-Philippe Wolf noticed early signs of Alzheimer's in his own 82-year-old mother. She opened a can with a, a screwdriver and a hammer, whereas the can opener was just in front of her. Mrs. Wolf was losing her memory. The recommendation? Do challenging mental exercises twice a week with a therapist. Now she lives alone, and her family is no longer considering putting her in a nursing home. 88% have reversible problems. That is to say, problems of memory that can be looked after. Dr. LaPonsin wrote a book called Brain Fitness, now in American bookstores. Now, in it and in books like it, you'll find lots of exercises that can test your memory, like the one we did before the break. Now, let's take another look at these simple objects on this screen. How many of these did you remember? Maybe the car, the ear, a pair of scissors? Well, if you didn't get them all, that's okay. But doing exercises like this can improve your memory, and best of all, perhaps reduce the chances that you'll get Alzheimer's as you grow older. The thing is to practice exercises which are absolutely special to the restitution of memory. Pat Masters, Channel 12 Eyewitness News. Good information there. And back now in our data center, our phone lines will be open until 7 o'clock this evening. And as we said, we have experts here ready to answer those questions you may have about Alzheimer's disease. Now let's send it back down to Walter. All right, Karen, our Alzheimer's alert continues tomorrow. We'll learn more about memory power and how it can help you in everyday life. Meteorologist Tony Petraka here in the Weather Center. It may have been sunny for a while this afternoon, but it didn't stay that way for very long. Check out these pictures. Trees and lines were down throughout the area. I'll be back in just two minutes to tell you if the worst is over. Keeping an eye on weather with Tony Petrarca. Well, good evening, everyone, and hello to the fourth graders at the Finberg School in Attleboro. I stopped by this afternoon, and oddly enough, we talked about thunderstorms, and then 
sure enough, Mother Nature gave them the real thing. We're going to talk about that in just a second. And thanks for the school bag, too. For tonight, perhaps a leftover shower, then clearing, turning windy and sharply, and I do mean sharply colder. Temperatures overnight, that should read 20 to 25 degrees. That would be by late tonight, early tomorrow morning. And for tomorrow, a mixture of clouds and sunshine, but a good 25 to 30 degrees colder tomorrow, a touch of winter. Temperatures for tomorrow only 30 to 35 degrees with a high wind watch in effect for tomorrow. We had some rough and tumble weather come by here this afternoon, showers and thunderstorms, but these storms were moving at 50 miles per hour, so they didn't last very long. And you notice on the western horizon, bye-bye storms, then the sun came out later on this afternoon, so things have quieted down. Now, what caused the thunderstorms? Well, I told the kids today that it's when cold air clashes with warm air. Well, we had cold air dropping down from Canada to clash with some of the mild air that we had this afternoon, and that caused all that wild weather, the showers and the thunder. You don't feel the cold now, but you will later tonight and tomorrow morning. High temperature for today when the sun broke out for a while, up to 61, actually 62 degrees, well above normal, low this morning at 43, a lot colder for tonight, westerly wind at 16 right now, and the relative humidity at uh, 75 percent. That air will start to dry off for later on tonight. Outside across the area, a mixture of clouds and sunshine, a few leftover showers. Temperature still mild in the upper 40s and lower 50s, 48. Hyannis, New Bedford at 50, and Providence at 49 degrees. But cold air is just around the corner. In fact, look at this map. These are actual temperatures to our north and west. It drops down to the teens, 20s, and 30s. That whole cold mound of air will be moving in for tonight and tomorrow. Now, radar shows the cold front just came through a line of showers and thunderstorms moving on out. A quick look at radar shows some of the heavier thunderstorms that came through this afternoon now moving off the coastline, so things should be quieting down finally and looking for a cold day tomorrow. Five-day forecast. Let's take a look at it. And it shows uh, only 37 degrees for tomorrow, but with the wind gusting to 40 miles per hour, gale warning in effect northwesterly, wind chills near zero. Thursday and Friday, not bad. A little bit milder, upper 40s and lower 50s, though clouds do return for Friday and Saturday. Could even be some drizzle by Saturday, so a 50-50 weekend. Mrs. J. Rigolette from Warwick, the Eye on Weather Umbrella winner. Congratulations. I'm meteorologist Tony Petraca. That is your Eye on Weather. Well, I'm Bob Halloran, live at the replacement upper deck. Actually, it's McCoy Stadium, where the 1995 Paw Sox are getting ready to play Meet the Press, and it's a chance for us to meet them, and we'll introduce you to them coming up next in sports. The game is on with Channel 12's Bob Halloran. Well, we've moved the upper deck down the field level here tonight as the 1995 Pawtucket Red Sox do play Meet the Press. The team season opener is just two days away in Toledo, so it's about time we all started to learn the names on the roster, including the five guys who up until a few days ago were considered replacement players. Now they've found their place on the Paw Sox roster. They include outfielders Aubrey Wagoner and Ron the Mayhay Kid, infielders Randy Brown and Don Barbara, and left-handed pitcher Chris Hill. And it is Chris Hill who joins us live now. And uh, Chris, I think a lot of people might be surprised to find so many replacement players on a AAA roster because when this whole thing started, you guys were supposed to be uh, fat, old, has-beens, or never worse. But actually, you know, the talent was pretty good down there. Well, yeah, matter of fact, you know, most of us have been playing. I mean, I just hate the fact that the media put it the way it was. I mean, yeah, there are a few guys that, you know, I haven't played in five or six years. And, I mean, I've been playing since 88, so, I mean, I'm just looking for a break. And, you know, hopefully I found it here with the Red Sox. Now, at the age of 25, you were released from the Houston Astros organization. Um, so your future in baseball is a little bit up in the air. Is, did replacement ball, um, if we can call it that, uh, revitalize um, or even save your career to some extent? I, yeah, I guess it has. But, you know, I, I'll say that I wasn't released. It was I was released by the Mets a few years back. And then, you know, as a free agent, I signed with the Red Sox from the Astros. But, you know, I just felt there was an opportunity here. You know, the Astros didn't give me one. And... Uh, you know, I just, you know, it's worked out. You know, playing down there with the games uh, got me a chance to be in front of Kevin Kennedy and uh, the, pit, the two pitching coaches down there and the staff and basically just, you know, showed them what, you know, type of pitcher I was and 
you know, what I can do. Well, now that you're here, we all wish you well. You're the opening day starting pitcher Thursday in Toledo, and good luck with that one. Thanks Thank very you. much. All right, well, the dream of playing Major League Baseball is still very much alive for players like Chris Hill and other replacements, but the dream may not be alive any longer for 32-year-old Carl Allaire of Woonsocket. John Butchergrass talked with him today as he arrived home from Detroit to resume his life as a husband and father of two. Welcome to the real world, again. Woonsocket's Carl Allaire returned home to Rhode Island today after six weeks of spring training with the Detroit Tigers. It was a lot more relaxed than a regular Major League Spring Training because I had been to one in 92 with Detroit. So, you know, it was a little different with Sparky not being there. Braves now look at He was, in essence, a big leaguer, wearing a big league uniform, and like here, playing in a big league park like Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. Third and heading home as a lair. But then, as fast as a Roger Clemens fastball, it was over. The replacements were told to go home. They were no longer needed. Does it hurt pretty bad? when you found out that was financially <laughs> only financially that's it i mean you know it was fun while it lasted and you know we we had charter flights and they treated us pretty well so it was pretty good from tf green airport in warwick i'm john butcher garage channel 12 eyewitness sports all right thanks but congratulations are in order for the ucla bruins basketball team here they are arriving home after winning the national championship last night they beat arkansas 89 78 it's ucla's first national title in 20 years and that'll do it for now live from mccoy stadium i'm bob halloran and that is a wrap from the upper deck still more to come on eyewitness news meet some local kids who are dancing for the health of it and experts are standing by to answer your questions about alzheimer's disease just call the number on your screen until seven You're watching Channel 12 Eyewitness News. Finally tonight, some local children getting the chance to dance at the Performing Arts Center. All eyes on these kids today, about 1,500 children taking part on the stage to perform. The Chance to Dance program is composed of some 27 area schools. What better place to do it, too, the Performing Arts Center? kids learn all about creating dance moves to go along with the music there. Good program for 27 schools. What a great schools. opportunity. We'll leave you with some more pictures of the data center. Don't forget all that line until 7 o'clock. We're back for 12 on 12 at 11. <laughs>